Today, I want to introduce you to one of our senior fellows and one of my favorite senior fellows, actually, because we've been together for such a long time. Um, Eric Warren, who is just a whiz at education policy and is currently an associate professor at Kennesaw State University. And what an addition to that great team. Hi, Eric. So now that I've said... Yeah, so now that I've said so much about you, what's left to say? Tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me. Like you said, I'm, um, I'm new at the Education Economics Center at Kennesaw State. Um, in the past, I've taught at private Catholic colleges. I was on the faculty at the School of Education at Georgia Gwinnett College for a long time. Um, I work for the state. K-12 Accountability Office, the, the Office of Student Achievement under Governor Purdue. Uh, and then way back, even before I knew you, I started as a, uh, a high school English and debate teacher in, in Gwinnett County. So you have literally been in the trenches of education. You, you've been everywhere. And <laughs> you're such a great asset to the, to the state. And, and um, we've followed your work. Through the years, and you've written some, some really great articles and commentaries for us, and you have been writing recently about something that has become really important with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So it's called a hybrid school. So tell us a little about that. Yeah, so I've been working on um, aspects of these schools for, for probably five years now. Um, and they surprisingly became um, really uh, more interesting to people in, in the last couple months. So they go by a lot of names. So some people call these things hybrid schools. Um, I typically call them hybrid homeschools. Um, they go by other names like parent partnership programs. Um, there's a brand called university model schools. But the basic idea is kids go to a a physical location, a school building, with teachers and classmates, um, desks, um, usually uniforms, two or three days a week. Okay. Rest of the week, they're homeschooled. So uh, they're, they're those two or three days, and it varies a lot. Some schools do slightly different schedules, but two or three days a week is a pretty typical one. So how are these formed? Who gets yeah, together formed, and does them? Sure. This these are great examples of um, civil society coming together, I think. Is, that's the way I like to describe them. They're typically really small. Um, there are a few networks of the schools around the country. But usually, they all have their own, their own backstory, their own origin story. But a typical one would be something like um, a group of homeschooling parents kind of works together, um, and, they, and their kids start to get older. Some of their neighbors get interested in what they're doing, and so maybe they rent out a room at a library, and then it continues to grow. So they rent out, you know, part of a school building. And eventually over time, you reach sort of a critical mass where you can, um, you know, take room from a church or buy your own building and, and operate a school two or three days a week. And, and other things happen the rest of the week. Okay, so why, why would you say they're necessary? I mean, we have public schools, we have home schools. Georgia yeah. specifically has a lot of school choice already. So why hybrid schools? Yeah, Georgia has some school choice. A lot of, a lot of places have some school choice. Um, conventional five-day schools do work for a lot of people. But in my research, what I'm finding is um, one of the main things that people like about these schools is the flexibility that it gives them. So I think a lot of parents now are getting a taste of, um, you know, I, I kind of like spending a little bit more time with my kids, but I don't want to be a full-time homeschooler. Oh, right? Okay. So we can handle it a few days a week, but maybe not five days a week. Um, so parents like that time. Um, many families will say, you know, my, my student um, is a high-level athlete or maybe a musician, and they need more time at the gym or more time. They go to Nashville every weekend, something like that. Mm -hmm. Just being in school two or three days a week opens up a lot of hours. Uh, that you can do other things with your time. So uh, your, would your day, say, in the classroom be more intense, or is it a, a typical experience for a student? Is there a yeah, special so schools, kind of student? 
Sure. Well, schools vary. Um, but I would say that the typical day would, it, at the schools that I'm most familiar with, would look a lot like a normal school day. It's the home days that look very different. And so um, some schools will, will just provide, you know, here's your task list for Monday and Wednesday. Get this work done whenever you get it done. And then we'll go over it on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, other schools are more, more wide open. They see them as sort of enrichment days for parents to do whatever okay. they want. But it really opens up a lot of time. So as a former English teacher, right, um, if you have kids in school 30 or 35 hours a week, five days a week, it's hard to assign them too much reading, for example, at home. But if you know they're home all day Monday and Wednesday, um, you, can, you can assign a little more. So, so I think that, that's an interesting difference that the kids face. Oh, okay, so so you sound like you're speaking from experience yourself. So, what what is your kids' education experience? What what have you done, as far as the gamut of education choice in Georgia, including hybrid school? Yeah, so I have um, seven kids, and the oldest two started at a public school, um, and it was perfectly fine. It's still perfectly fine, but we we switched over to a hybrid school several years ago. And so um, just anecdotally, what I've been seeing is we, our schedule didn't really change all that much with the shutdown. Um, you know, a lot of my kids' friends went from going to school 35 hours a week, and doing a little bit of work at home, to the complete opposite of that. Whereas we are kind of used to being home three days a week. And so, so they have some experience kind of um, self-regulating and working at working on assignments at home and then interacting with their teachers mm -hmm. online. So it hasn't been completely seamless, but it's been a lot less of a dramatic change, I think, for us than for others. Uh, what do you see about this model, um, the, the, the attraction to this model going forward? We have, you know, the COVID pandemic, uh, pandemic and a lot of folks are home with their kids and trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future with, with, with whether there's a recurrence, you know, a new outbreak, a, a tougher I, outbreak, so much uncertainty. So what do you see on, on with, with this model and with, with education in general? Sure. So you never know. You know, I'm not, I'm not an epidemiologist, but even the epidemiologists seem to be not very sure. Um, but we could have, like you say, recurrences, and then we have another shutdown in October. So this one was not the worst case because it happened, you know, two thirds or three quarters of the way through the school year. But if we shut down in October again, everybody can see that's pretty disruptive. So right. like I just said, uh, these, these schools are less disruptive because the kids have practice um, doing work at home and then turning it into their teachers. Um, I should say the, the kids at these hybrid schools, when they do work on the home days, they're not tied to screens all day. So they might download a lesson plan from their teacher, but that lesson plan is going to look more like, um, you know, do this reading, go outside and do this thing with your, you know, with your project, um, talk, to your, talk to your family about this other thing. Um, so they're not tied to that. I think another attraction is gonna be the cost over time. So because these schools, they typically have only one full-time employee, if any, everybody else is part-time, um, most of them don't have the kind of personnel and facilities needs that other schools do. So the average tuition at these schools nationwide is, is something like $5,000 or less, mm -hmm. which wow. allows, yeah. So, so we said, you know, Georgia has a lot of school choice, but across the country, there is a lot of school choice if you have a lot of money or if you go, if you live in a very bad school system, right? But this sort of broad middle class where they're, you know, maybe in, in a school system that doesn't qualify them for a choice program, but they don't make enough money to, to stroke off large tuition checks are kind of left out. So these hybrid schools are, are a way in for a lot of middle class families that, that need lower tuition or have multiple kids that are trying to pay for. I understand. So you have a book coming out on this entire um, a, a approach. Um, what's the name of the book? When's it coming out? And if people have any questions, how do they get hold of you? Yeah, so I do have a book coming out. It's called Little Platoons, Defining Hybrid Homeschools in America. So, um, and I chose that title because, as I said at the beginning, this really is a way for 
really small local groups who want to kind of um, do something for their communities to come together and start a school. You know, we have these big fights over school choice policies. We've had lawsuits and legislative battles. But most of these schools, the parents are just sort of doing it, right? They're mm -hmm. just kind of coming to and doing it and not worrying about the political fights. Um, so the book goes into kind of the history of these schools and their relationship to homeschooling. So some early examples of these schools have been around since the 1980s, but there really aren't. Um, this is the first book that's really addressing them as a sector of the education world. So I'm defining what they look like, um, who attends them around the country, and, it, and it, it's maybe not the middle of the income distribution, but it's not the richest of the rich people. Uh -huh. What do they say they like about it? Um, you know, and then some policy implications for things like the cost and how we might promote this this sort of thing through through policy and how we might address them through um, you know regulation or accreditation or other things like that. Oh, when is it coming out? And it will come out depending on the uh, uh, coronavirus outbreak in D.C. and New York. Um, it should be um, into this summer. Okay, well, great. And how can people get hold of you aside from checking out your great work on our pages at the Georgia Policy Foundation? Yeah, so you can, you can email me at eWaren at Kennesaw.edu um, or I'm on Twitter at uh, Eric underscore Waren. Okay, well, great. And if you need to get a hold of us, you can find us at georgiapolicy.org, Georgia Public Policy Foundation, and our senior fellow, Eric Wern. Thanks so much for your time, Eric.